Okay, um, history in the light of reincarnation. Now, um, what I'm, this is based on uh, really the premise that history, civilization, and reincarnation are all part of human evolution. Uh, part of what? Human evolution. Okay, now, in my view, there's no theory of history. People have tried to um, turn history into a social science, and I believe uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace was an attempt to come up with a theory of history. But they've never managed to make it into a social science, like sociology or anthropology. It's, um, that this, it's, there are too many variables. It's, it's more complicated than that. Mm. But history is a tool of human evolution. I, I certainly believe that. And also the fact that um, the element of reincarnation is in there puts it beyond social science, or Can beyond the of social science. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but it's a general apology. Did you just say history is a tool of... Can you speak up better? We can't Did you say that... Sorry, that's funny. Did you actually say that history is a tool of human evolution? Yes. I'll, okay. I'll expand on that as we you go. You will expand on it. Oh, oh yes, no, it's a tool. I didn't know is what you meant. Uh, yeah, to, it, that's it, what we're, we're talking about history. Now, <laughs> the concept of history um, <laughs> is not just events. Um, now, prior to recorded history, we had um, oral histories, legends, and a mythical past. Um, this was also a component in our, in our evolution, the, the, the role of myth and legend. It, it's, it's something that we learn from it, it teaches us something. Now, Herodotus, who uh, lived 44 to 425 BCE, he was the first known person, although there may have been others it, that have been <coughs> forgotten on, in other parts of the world. As far as Western civilization is concerned, Herodotus was the first known person to record the course of past events as a narrative. And therefore, they say that he invented history. Um, now, uh, his accounts are skewed by his, his perception and his political agenda. But he certainly wasn't the worst. Mm. I think that's all, history has always been mm. subject to this, written by the winning side, written to political advantage. Um, and also, I've, said, I've heard that this is the same with the Bible. The Bible was written, rewritten in 400 BC to show that in every instance God came out on top. Mm. So the, even the, the, the Bible uh, is, is not beyond this. Mm. Um, now, although there's distortions, you can make certain observations about history. Um, firstly, history repeats itself in the, same, in the sense that the same situations come round again and again. And um, who's um, seen or heard on the radio this set to die, Winston Churchill's History of Britain? Ah, someone has, but you've seen it. Well, I've heard it all on the radio. No. Um, the number of times the same paradigms come round again uh, in, in British history. In fact, um, there is a theme going, spanning several hundred years that I've noticed. If you go back to the Magna Carta, the barons uh, made King John sign a charter. Uh, but they weren't trying to overthrow him. They weren't trying to overthrow the government. They just wanted a better deal. Uh, it's a similar situation with Watt Tyler's Peasants' Revolt in 1381, that the actual aim was a better deal, not um, changes to the system, not actually overthrowing the government. Uh, the English Civil War well, began as a, an attempt to control the king and they ended up executing him. Uh, so that, that went a bit further that time. Um, but the Chartist movement, and they, they got the Chartist, they got the idea of the Charter from the Magna Carta, um, that was a movement to secure a better deal for ordinary working people. It had support through, in some of the higher echelons of power, newspaper owners and, and others supported Chartism because they thought it, it was a good idea. But it, it was not an attempt to overthrow the government, it was to get a better deal. And again with the, trade, the rise of the trade union movement. Initially, the trade unions wanted a better deal for their workers, for the workers, for their members, and it, it was not an attempt um, to overthrow the state, to overthrow the government. And that, that, that pattern spans uh, several hundred years. Even the 1832 Reform Bill 
um, was a response to the, really to the problems of the Peterloo massacre, that, that something had to be done about the parliamentary system. Um, the people at Peterloo were at Peterloo were not were not wanting to overthrow the government. They were protesting about the the price of bread and the fact that Manchester had no proper MP because the parliamentary system was out of date. Um, again, this this idea of wanting the better deal, so it it, it, it repeats itself, and I think that that's significant. Um, and as I'll, I'll expand on it later. Um, constant change. Um, political systems such as empires, countries, governments rise and fall. I think that's fairly obvious. A lot of stuff's been and gone. Empires, British Empire, Roman Empire. Um, yes, it's, uh, nothing, nothing lasts. Um, ideas from previous eras re-emerge and are adopted. Um, I've got something uh, on this from current um, Pomalaji Jinrajadaza, as it happens. <laughs> Um, on this uh, about pe uh, people re-emerging from uh, reincarnated from earlier eras and he's big on that um, now history is more than a record of events it's something we can study and we can learn from and this makes, this is what, my point here, it make, makes an important tool in our evolution that the fact that we have it it is, we have records of, of, the, of events and course of history and we can study it and learn from it, and that helps us evolve. Right, that, that's, that's my premise there. Right. It's not social science, though. <laughs> keep, keep, keep up with that one. Um, now, history, as we define it, hasn't always existed. Um, we've, we've, we've heard the word prehistoric, prehistory, prehistoric, so it hasn't always existed. Um, what has made it possible? Um, right. Now, if we go back to before civilization, um, hunter gatherers needed to control sufficient territory to support their tribe. I don't know if we'll dispute that one. I, I, I don't see that they had to control enough land with whatever they hunted and gathered on it to support themselves. And that this would bring them into conflict with other tribes over territory. And in fact, this territorial advantage still exists today. Um, well, it's more to do with natural resources and natural territory. Um, now, societies don't experience war and peace, but war and diplomacy. I think that there was somewhere in our evolution, we got to a point where tribes could negotiate. And they would say there'd be a boundary like a river. And they would say, right, on the other side, that's yours, on the other side, the balance is ours. And if we don't cross the river, then there won't be any trouble. And they would do deals. There would be, um, possibly they would have shamans who would do negotiate, because the Druids used to negotiate for the, the, the Celtic tribes. Um, but you, although that was, that was in an, under an agrarian system. But I think we developed the ability to negotiate so you wouldn't be constantly at war with a neighbouring tribe you would have an agreement, some sort of truce, and it'd be a boundary or, or whatever, there'd be some agreement, and you wouldn't, and once you've got to the level where you can broker an agreement, you've got cooperation. So you've got war and diplomacy. Unfortunately, when diplomacy breaks down, you go back to war. When you've exhausted war, you go over to diplomacy. The um, person who came up with this theory of war and diplomacy was Karl von Clausewitz, a Prussian army officer, who said that the like each war and diplomacy are an ancillary of each other. There's, there's no such thing as war and peace. Um, but that 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 bit of ability to cooperate, I think, is, is was essential in our evolution. Um, that we co we it's not all war. We can we can cooperate. Now this this cooperation plus the agrarian revolution. Now we we invented farming, or they they invented farming on the, fer the fertile crescent about um, 16,000 years ago. Um, it took 5,000 years for, the, for agriculture to get from Iraq to here, I believe, at least 5,000 years. Uh, so it didn't catch on everywhere straight away. Um, now, that, the rise of civilization then made history possible, and history as we understand it, um, well, 
learning is passed down the generations. The events have happened, events can be studied and learned from. And also, the information can be disseminated around the world. I mean, we live in the information age now, but even um, in the Roman times, learning would be transferred around the world. And there, was, there was contacts between, say, uh, the, the Roman Empire and possibly areas outside it, so people travelled. Um, and so that the information would be passed around the world. Um, again, part of our evolution is a sort of um, civilization forming part of our evolution. Now, and this is the last time I'm going to put his full name, I've cut it from a large Jinrajidaza, um, postulated. Um, nations have a purpose. A nation uh, provides a framework in which man can evolve. Lessons can be learned and can, can be worked through. It is a framework, and it's it's beyond, I think, the original tribal society, which normally interacts on a, at a very limited, enclosed level. Um, a nation um, can be a powerhouse of ideas and progress, or it can go the other way. We take the the um, comparison of Athens and Sparta, two completely different outfits. Uh, operating more or less side by side. Do you mean a state when you say a nation? Or a well, the, we, we've got the concept now of the nation state, mm. but um, you can have an, um, within Britain we have several nations. Uh, who so you're talking about a people? A people, people yeah. yeah. Um, in this part of the same. That's right. That some countries, I mean the Swiss, uh, the modern Swiss, are. Um, there are four actual nations within one country. Mm. So you could say that they have a national identity as Switzerland, but also they have their identities within Switzerland, and even their own canton will have an identity. Just as Cornwall and Wales and Scotland have identities within mainland Britain, mm. um, and in many ways some people regard the north of England as a separate entity from the south. Mm. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's a questionable one. Um, and um, yeah, the, the, uh, I suppose you've got countries used to have countries like Austria-Hungary that were actually a country but they, there was like 13 or was it 18 there's quite a lot of ethnicities within one country um, but um, the nation, the idea of the organised national entity and the organised state, it all has a purpose and it, it's part of our evolution that we, we came from <coughs> tribal societies yeah. to nations and states so the nation the nation state which in some ways I think is in decline the, the, uh, the nation state probably peaked around the Elizabethan times I think it's been in decline for several hundred years but it, it is still there um, um, different nations teach humanity different things and there's new nations come up, which is Australia, New Zealand, say, as the examples. And uh, some nations disappear. Um, and I've given here Prussia and Pigland. Uh, you won't find them on the map now. Um, the other, I mentioned, I mentioned Switzerland, um, the um, Helvetii. Um, when they did Latin at school, they were translated as the Swiss. I didn't know this, but apparently they were a Celtic tribe who seemed to have disappeared from history. They weren't the modern Swiss. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, a group that's, that's vanished. And there must be many um, over the last few thousand years of uh, groups uh, that regard themselves as national entities which, which have either merged with others or just disappeared you know, into, in, into history, just as the Picts have. We've got quite a few in this country. We've got Mercia and. Uh, not where, sorry? Mercia. Mercy. Yes, the, the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms would have regarded themselves as separate countries at one time. Yeah, separate. Yeah. That's right. It took us, it took us centuries to get to United England. <laughs> yes. I don't know, Wales. Um, it, it took a long time to get to United Wales, didn't it? Because um, mm, yeah. the actual Wales was not united as a single political entity till about 1536. Well, not a political game. You know in that sense, isn't it? Oh, it is. It, it, not it, like Scotland. Um, 
Ah, Scotland was a separate country at one yeah. time in its own right. Wales was more of a territory and a collection of uh, kingdoms, principalities, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and occupied never territories achieved, by the never Normans. Achieved state, oh, that's the Sorry? Wales never achieved statehood. No, there was never a self-governing independent Welsh state. There's never a Welsh king uh, of uh, Wales. Not of, the whole, not of the whole of Wales. No, it no. was a number of rival kingdoms. Mm. And eventually mm. um, they were... Uh, but it's, it was, I believe we got our aggressive colonialism from the Normans. Um, and mm. then with the first who decided to uh, well, build the castles. We got, and then... Mm. Um, actually, it was Owen Glendour, um, or it was actually Henry, uh, Harry Hotspur who lost it for Wales. Uh, the Battle of Shrewsbury, which I think is 14-2. Um, had Harry Hotspur won, claimed the throne and named his father uh, Henry Percy Senior, um, Wales, in return, or Owen Glendour, in return for his cooperation and support for Harry Hotspur, would have got an independent self-governing Welsh state which included the Wirral um, and anyway it went the other way Henry the um, uh, Henry the fourth won so um, they went the other way but had Harry Hotspur won there would have been a separate independent Welsh state yes. and that, that, that would have changed history that I think. Have, yeah. um, but that, that, it didn't happen and that was really Harry Hotspur's fault because Despite the, the <laughs> heroic name and having a football team named yeah. after him, um, <laughs> he uh, he was not a great military commander. He had more men at Shrewsbury, and he had the high ground. Had he waited for Old Glendor to get there, he, he would definitely have won. But no, he, he went early and lost. Um, oh, that's so, so I suppose, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so that was one of the great what ifs of history. Yeah. You just can't get the staff, can you? <laughs> <laughs> um, now, Emil Durkheim. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Emil Durkheim postulated that we're all products of our society and there is little we can do about it. And that's probably true for most of us, to perhaps rise above that. But nationality, I do think, shapes our personal evolution. I think it, it does make a difference to the life you live and who you are and how you see yourself. I think it's part, and from life to life, I think it's, it's part of your personal evolution. Is that David Owen? Is he a philosopher? Uh, he's a sociologist. Oh, a sociologist. Yeah. Well, what period is he in? Uh, around 1900, he's French. Oh, OK. All right. I'm sorry. Yeah. you knew that. Yeah, OK. Uh, right, now, reincarnation is, um, has an important role in human evolution. Um, when reincarnation was joined by civilization, uh, I think the two are important, this marked a significant leap forward in our evolution. Man born into um, civilization rather than born into, say, like a tri tribal society, because the, the opportunities for personal development in one life are exponentially greater in if you, if you have. Um, a sort of civilised setup. The, um, not civilised. Um, you you are in um, the what we call a civilization rather than a tribal society. It is exponentially greater. Do you mean that we're more individualistic and we've got more freedom? Whereas if you're part of a tribe, you really can part. You just a, you a part of. It's the very tribe. limited. It's very and limited. Like, is that what you mean? That's, that's what I mean. Yes. Yeah. There's so there's so much more. Freedom, yeah. It's possible in terms of personal development. Yeah, I see. Uh, being born, say, mm. in, um, I suppose you could say, urban society, well, an agrarian mm. society as opposed to a hunter gatherer society. Mm. And then we've moved on now to technological societies. We don't consider ourselves agrarian anymore. Mm. Um, so I think that was, a, that was a significant leap forward in our evolution. Now, what I mentioned is the. Some of the ideas I've got have come from this um, History in the Light of Reincarnation by Ginnarajah Dalsa, uh, published around the time of the First World War. Not all the ideas in it I agree with, uh, because he had a rather rosy view of the role of the British Empire in world, in world history, uh, which uh, I don't oh. think would be entirely acceptable now. 
but um, he was a Sri Lankan aristocrat. Yeah. Um, some of the ideas have come from this, and some of the ideas are um, Now, he uh, postulated that karmically linked egos, I'm going to use the word ego, I use the word, I'm meaning reincarnating egos, um, can reincarnate from an earlier era and bring about in innovations that take humanity forward or changes that, that, um, from which we can learn. And this is happening all the time, that there are always in society people who are coming up or being reincarnated from an earlier era with ideas from these earlier eras. Um, and it's always happening. Why should that be that? Well, you've got to reincarnate somewhere. If you believe in reincarnation... Yeah, yeah. And you, you, um, right. And it gives the impression of sort of isolated people... So are in a much earlier era, and then they suddenly come forward. Yes, yes, he, that, he says this can happen. He does yeah. say that. That oh, they can be linked, oh, and they all reincarnate together, yeah. Oh, right, okay. Yes, and that's why history sometimes turns backwards. Mm. Um, okay, um, now, one example he gives is that the Renaissance um, is the result of karmically linked egos reincarnating from the classical Greek era. Now, um, classical Greece, the golden age of Athens, was from about 480 BC to about 4, 400 BC. That was the good, that's, that's really what we said was classical Greece. The whole period itself um, lasted about 150 years. Um, Alexander the Great was, was later than that, um, about 70 years later. Um, and he was uh, half Greek, half Macedonian. Um, Cicero doesn't come into this, does he? Um, Cicero, um, I think, referred to Herodotus as the father of history. I, I, yeah. I, I'll have to check on that. He was around. He, he, got some, he, yeah. um, he was in on the act. Yeah. Um, but a very short period of history, which has had a phenomenal influence on Western civilization. Um, and the Renaissance, uh, although the, um, the actual learning of, of the Greek period was not lost, it's very interesting how the Renaissance was a revival of that learning and that in those traditions. Which Renaissance are you referring to? The, is, oh, sorry, the, um, the, 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 late, the, the, um, the late 15th century. Yeah, talking the, about the, the, nor the northern Italian mercantile yeah. states. Mm. They're really the beginning of the Renaissance. But the Renaissance, the, it, 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 it pervaded everything. It, um, it, had, it changed the name. It became the Enlightenment and all sorts of Well, the Enlightenment things. was later, but yes, yeah, the, it, it, it led to that. Changed, yeah. There are a number, of, it, a number of things that it led to. But, mm. um, the, this, this was... Um, what led to this was actually the reincarnation of a number of egos from the classical mm. Greek period. Yes. And this is... Um, Ginnarach and Dalsha postulates this because it, it, the mm. Renaissance, the, both the classical Greek period, the Golden Age of Athens, mm. and the Renaissance are remarkable periods mm. um, of history when we, we, we shove things forward. And at the Renaissance, both, both periods still have an influence today. Um, um, and you're saying that the incarnation is significant to this then? Yes. Yes, yes egos reincarnate from yes. earlier eras and yes, reintroduce ideas. Um, now, mm. uh, he also postulates that an individual ego can reincarnate and reintroduce ideas from the past and change history. Now, sometimes this is not always good, um, but we have to learn from history, and sometimes <coughs> we have to learn the same lessons again, mm. or go through the same thing to learn the lessons. Um, now, I've given some examples here. These are my examples, not um, Jim Rajadars's. Uh, W.B. Yeats. Now, he um, revived the idea of Celtic mysticism. Most of the interest in Celtic identity and Celtic mysticism today is a result of him. Um, I, I would say that he, his idea of the, um, the, the sort of mythical Celtic past and Celtic traditions... Is that the person who, who did a lot of history in, in reference to those abuses? I'm not that, sure. I'm not sure about needs? that. I, he was a member of many things. He was yeah. even a member of a, a theosophical lodge in Dublin yeah. for a while. Um, his influence is, is, is quite widespread. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Frederick William I of Prussia. Um, he 
Well, he was, he was a very, he was a brilliant reformer. But one of the things he did, he re, really, really um, instated the idea of the Teutonic Knights. Of the, and he revived this tradition of militarism. And uh, in a way, Prussian militarism um, goes back the, to him in that Frederick the Great actually inherited the best army in Europe from him. Um, and so he, he, in a way, he took something from the past and, and, and revived it. Um, Ayatollah Khomeini, definitely somebody who I think has changed history, because I mean, we've had the word caliphate has come back in the modern era. Um, I mean, the last caliphate really was the Ottoman Empire, they say, but the word caliphate really goes back to the, the, the golden age of Islam, which is so, uh, oh, a thousand years ago. Um, and he revived the, these ideas, um, he revived the thinking. Um, Cardinal Richelieu. Now, <coughs> um, Richelieu, he um, took um, a number of classical Greek traditions, like the classical Greek theatre, and reintroduced it into French society because Molière's plays are based on classic, the classical Greek style where everything takes place in a circle and uh, all information is brought um, to the, this circle. Um, and he saw that as a stabilising influence on society. Also, his centralised government, he went back to an earlier form of, of monarchy which really would be more, more, you know, the king was an absolute ruler, like in the days of, of Charlemagne, the Holy Roman Empire. So he, he took ideas from the past. Um, and finally, General Franco. Um, Franco was, to me, an extreme conservative. He revived the Spanish monarchy. Uh, it had been abolished, and he, he brought it back. In fact, I think... Uh, in the modern era, uh, Spain is the only country uh, to actually bring back a monarchy. Not only once they've gone, they've gone. I mean, you know, well, not, we not brought back the Tsar after the end. <laughs> what? We did it once. Well, we ah, modern oh. era. Yes, we did. We, we brought back the monarchy in 1660. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, after the modern within. But you're, what you're referring to now that the, the Spanish did that twice, didn't they? Uh, yes, they, they, they've had the republics before and they brought back the monarchy, but he brought back the monarchy... Um, You're talking about Franco now? Franco, yes. But, but this, his, this his Spain was a Spain of the past. He, he adopted the title Caudillo. If you look at the Spanish coin at the time, it says, uh, General, General Franco, um, Caudillo de España. The term Caudillo is a sort of warrior leader. It's more like El Cid was a warrior leader. It's um, the whole concept of um, Francoism <laughs> is something from very Spanish and, and rooted in the past. Was General Franco a king then? No, he wasn't. He was, he was, he was a Caudillo. He, yeah. he wasn't a dictator. He was a Caudillo. He, 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 was, he was, was, to, all, to all practical purposes, he was a dictator yeah. and he was an Axis leader left over from the war. He hadn't been deposed. He got away with it because he yeah. stayed out of the war. But um, Within Spain, his... Um, his regime was rooted in the past. But his, his thing was part of a... There were a group of countries in Europe, approximately four, that were, that were, in a, were regarded as fascist, fascist states. Um, he, he's a uh, part no. of that, isn't he? Well, he's he, one of the four. He he was, well, Germany. firstly, he was never a leader of a fascist movement. Ooh. Hitler and Mussolini were. Hitler and Mussolini were political leaders of fascist movements. Yes. Franco was a military dictator. There was a the Nazi party in Spain led by José Antonio Primo de Rivera and it was incorporated in the Spanish system. It, it never really ran the country. Franco ran the country. He, I don't... He, he, OK, he was regarded as, as being aligned to the, the Axis powers, mm. but he was a hyper-conservative. Mm. But most historians will tell you he was one of the four fascist states, doesn't he? That Spain was one of the four... Well, it was regarded as fascist because of the yeah. time it existed, but... Franco's style of government uh, was he was the, the last in a long line of Spanish dictators that go back centuries. Ah. There have the, been several um, um, Spanish dictators who were actually worse than Franco. 
he was on the average. Yeah. Um, no, Franco to me was was a dictator, military ruler in the Spanish tradition, and he just happened to be going at the same time as Hitler and Mussolini. Yeah. Um, I think that our some so-called professional historians who do say exactly what you say. Thank you, too kind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> glad, glad to be of assistance. <laughs> okay. okay. You're on the road track. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, right, now I've got something at the end. We'll finish with this one. Here's an idea for consideration. Can the belief in the coming of a messiah or charismatic leader actually bring about the incarnation of such a figure. Yeah. It's an interesting one. Yeah. Anyone want to talk about that one? This is the last slide. This is this winds it up. Where does the belief come from? The belief? Well, um... If it isn't an idea that something's coming. That, that's right. Somebody has to come up with the idea that there will be, say, a world teacher... Messiah. Um, I mean, with Krishnamurti, um, he was believed to be the new world teacher, so they set him up as the new world teacher. Mm. Um, they gave him 12 disciples. I don't know where they got that from, but they gave him 12 <laughs> disciples. And it was, he knew that was going to be. I mean, at the time, you, you could see that's going to be a recipe for disaster. Because mm. he, um, mm. he grew up. And eventually, he had, it took some courage, really. And he says, no, I'm not the Messiah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he, he cleared off. Um, but um, it's problematic, that question, with the word Messiah, because take the classical example of the Messiah, which is the one we all know about in this room. Yeah. He was, that, I mean, the, what did the, the Jews have in mind? Because they had a mess, messianic well, this movement, Jews, and that was a sort of political thing, wasn't it? It wasn't a, a world teacher as such, was it? No, no, it was, it was a Jewish charismatic, it was, it was really, a, their Messiah was more of a charismatic nationalist leader. Mm, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and they thought that Jesus was him, and he... he, he who thought, thought, who were they? The Jews, some Jews thought he was, but yeah. he, 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 he wasn't, he didn't fulfil the prophecies. But... If you take the Old Testament, they say that um, Jesus actually fulfilled a thousand prophecies in the Old Testament. Who are they? St- Who say that? Uh, well, um, a number of religious groups. Now, no Jehovah's Witnesses say this. Ah, um, that they, they are very good historians. Oh, yeah, they are very good. But yeah. they, in the fact it, 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 they're claiming yeah. this, and there may be something in it that um, uh, Christ fulfilled a number of prophecies and did these prophecies help to bring about this thing coming. Yeah. Uh, well, there is. There is a, 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 there is a thing, a concept called self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, yeah, that's, that's right, yes. Yeah. So, to what extent uh, expectations influence uh, reincarnating egos? Because it can be a dangerous thing. So if people believe, you know, well, we're, we're on the brink of destruction, then, then quite possibly... Well, you said it's about bank failures in America mm. in, the, in the 20s and 30s, that once somebody... Uh, start, once you started thinking a bank was dodgy, it would fail because mm. people believed mm. it, it was dodgy, even it was sound. Mm. Everyone wants the money on the same day, and the bank would collapse. Mm. Um, so yeah. The, the, um, what something. I said about Jehovah's Witnesses was, I think, well, no, was, it, was it was meant as, as a cynical comment. No, no. If, if they they have, um, mm. they, they're good at predicting things. Um, yes, they um, predicting the end of the world, which they've done about three times now. Yeah. It hasn't ended so much. But, um, well, well, Nostradamus is good at that. Mm-hmm. Not good. Yeah. Ah, Nos- now, good. Nostradamus, no. Nostradamus predicted events. He didn't predict history. And it's disputed as to whether his predictions went on to 3250 AD or 3700. But... Um, mm. There's a lot of stuff to go at, and they're just events. They're not the course of history. So what about his prediction that the world would end in 1999? I, I don't yeah. know. Is that, is that an interpretation? Well, because there was a Nostradamus group in uh, New York believed that Hitler was going to re-emerge in 1952, mm. which I didn't, and therefore they lost a lot of credibility mm. over that. Um, but that was an interpretation of one of his prophecies yeah. that Hitler was actually not dead well, and he was going to re- yeah. reappear. But Nostradamus is wrong about Hitler in any case. 
because he What's didn't predict it, right? predicted somebody called Isla. Hister, it was Hister. Hister, was it? Well, OK, he got the name. All right, really, not that. Is that I mean, OK, Napoleon <laughs> was Paul um, yeah. um, So, but, How yeah. about the, um, the fact that the Buddhists, you know, in Tibet, believe that when the Dalai Lama passes away, another one will be reincarnated? That's right, right, yes. That's right. So they believe in it, and then they... They go looking for they have an idea of what town to look in, and yes. they eventually take some old objects from the previous Dalai Lama, yeah. and the young child recognises the old objects, and then he's the new Dalai Lama. Well, that's right, yeah. So that's the incarnation, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Well, they do say the current Dalai Lama, he, he, when they came looking for him, he recognised them all or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Isn't the here. same mm. person the incarnation then? Um, you said reincarnating so ego. Well, well, I use it because I... Not you don't use that for the theosophical term, but the same being kind of illegal. I think so, yeah. yeah. No, it's the same, it's the same link, he's the same guy. But as he says himself, can you remember your past lives? I can't remember what I had for breakfast. No, he eats uh, what, what actually survives from... Actually, that's been very interesting to me, what survives from life to life. It's an essence of the life lived. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, if you're a Manchester United supporter in one life and a Mongolian milkman in the next... Then you know you don't, are you going to be a Mongolian milkman that supports Manchester United? Mm. Possibly not. Mm. Difficult one that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we 